Bob has is recovering from COVID. And um, I just got one announcement, which is next week's Burger and Forum. We'll, we'll be back in Nevins with free tea and coffee. And that is Kelsey Sikana, the visiting assistant professor of photography, giving a talk entitled The Ghosts of Inst Instagram on Photography at the End of the World. Today, we're very happy to have Bob Myers, professor of anthropology and a veteran Burger and Forum attendee and presenter. And his talk is entitled Groundhog Day, Candlemas and Super Bowl uh, 48. Prophecies large and small. Bob, thanks for um, rising from your sickbed and doing this. Emerson, thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, welcome everyone on this bright February 2nd, sometimes known as Groundhog Day. And clearly it's happened again. But I'm talking first of all about Bergen Forums. Bergen Forum has happened again. This is Bergen Thursday. And it's interesting to me that it's such an auspicious uh, coincidence that Bergen Thursday on February 2nd last happened in 2017, and it's not going to happen again until 2034, and then until 2040. So thanks for being here. Please be patient. Please realize that all deficiencies of this, of this presentation, any organization, any glitches, any flaws like we've already been going through are all due to COVID and not to me. <clears throat> I'll be jumping back and forth between slides and between a whole bunch of words. So again, please be patient about that. The big picture here is predicting the future. I've labeled it prophecy, but maybe prophecy is too large a problematic word for what I'm talking about, or maybe not, I don't know. Maybe they're just predictions, but they take so many different forms. And when you start thinking about this idea of predictions, how do we think about anything in the future? How do we get there from here? How do we, uh, uh, how do we organize our lives according to these predictions? Think about as many different types of this as you can. Uh, and they, they take different names. We name them so many different things that we subdivide them and we forget that it's all about prophesying the future. These are some of the different names that we use, not all of them at all. And some of the different uh, devices that we use to help figure out the future. Those crystal balls, uh, reading tea leaves, horoscopes, almanacs, projections, but then in modern days, we get into algorithms and big data. The uncertainties of nearly everything uh, demand that we think about the future, that we try to figure out the future. This is difficult and only available to special people and special creatures with certain skills. <clears throat> Those select non-humans sometimes mythological and sometimes of different animal species, uh, help us see the future as well. And the thing about knowing the future is that it garners reverence and attention and bestows power in some cases. Now, prophecy or prediction has often meant some level of connection to the sacred and to cosmic forces or to whatever happens to be hallowed at the time. It might be religious, it might be nature-based, it might be technological, it's often financial. And so it's a big field of different options, but I'm going to focus on three specific ones. And as you'll see in these three, and actually in most uh, predictive powers throughout history and culture, uh, these are controlled by men. Not all, but most. A prediction about the future might be humankind's salvation. It might be the arrival of spring. It might be economic windfalls. It might be winning the annual NFL extravaganza, or it might be a hundred other futures. These are all different names for ways humans deal with the future, with uncertainty. But as long as there have been humans staring into a fire or a screen and thinking about tomorrow or beyond, it's been important. And those with prophetic powers merit special consideration. The subtext of this story are the persistence of prophetic belief 
in the midst of materialistic high-tech society, as well as the embeddedness of chance in a world keen on knowing the future. I'm trying to connect human efforts using astronomical events through the threads of winter celebrations and weather forecasts with migration, cultural adaptation, animal transformations, and informal national holidays on the midwinter seasonal cross-quarter day with European pagan, Christian religious, and commercial secular prophecies used to manage the unknown. Whew, I'm tired already. Yikes. This is about cultural and personal explorations of our hopes and dreams, but I'm getting too holistic. I'll back off. My focus is on three events, which happened on the same day for the first time ever, and centering them on weather anchors a common condition. Weather, dangerous, life-threatening, atmospheric changes shared among all of us. Why 2014? Well, because that's the year that I went to see the Groundhog Day celebration down in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. And it turned out to be Candlemas, February 2nd. February 2nd is always Candlemas. And it turned out in 2014 to be the day of the Super Bowl. It was Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday, uh, several years ago. And this Super Bowl, Super Bowl turned out to be very different than any other Super Bowl, Super Bowl so far. But in 2014, these prophetic events coincided to speak volumes about how we deal with uncertainty. Very quickly, <clears throat> I'll elaborate a little bit more on this. But Candlemas, I'm sure you all know already, but just in case there are a couple of people who don't know what Candlemas is, it's based in St. Simeon's recognition of Mary's infant as the savior of us all. Mary presented her baby 40 days after his birth, as required by Jewish tradition, and the rest is big history. February 2nd, Groundhog Day, the most watched weather forecast of the year, and the only one led by a rodent, is pretty remarkable. This rodent is astonishing. He's mind-boggling. Will spring be early or late? Well, we already know. <clears throat> and this Super Bowl, Super Bowl 48, became the weather bowl or snow bowl. And it was played in New Jersey, East Rutherford, New Jersey at MetLife Stadium, one of the NFL's largest stadiums. And it's uncovered. It's not contained and it's not in a warm weather place. It was between the Denver Broncos and the Seattle Supersonics more later. I'm gonna bounce back and forth between words, pictures and details. Please be patient. I'll probably cut out a bunch before we ever get to the end. So, <clears throat> prophecies, transformations, hopefulness, big changes. You know, look, these are pretty big pictures. How are we going to save humankind? Who's going to save it? How do we stay safe? Is spring ever coming? Did weather affect this Super Bowl in New Jersey? Well, first of all, we've got to connect culture with astronomy. And I'm talking about these seasonal midpoints, also known as cross-quarter days. They're very big in many different cultures. In our culture, it has to do with Groundhog Day and Candlemas. In other cultures, fire festivals are very common. And the point is that February 2nd is the midpoint between, yes, the winter solstice and the vernal equinox. Candlemas, more about Candlemas. Candlemas is the uh, celebration of the presentation of the Christ child by Mary 40 days after his birth. And it's required by Jewish law that she do this. If she had had a baby girl, then the presentation would have been 80 days after birth. All of this is part of Mary's purification. And in this special case, when she presented the baby Jesus at the temple, St. Simeon, the reigning priest at the time, recognized that 
this was the fulfillment of an older prophecy where he had been told that he would not die until he had seen the Son of God born of a virgin. Just, um, you know, absorb that for a moment. It was a big day for St. Simeon and a big day for the rest of the world. <clears throat> the moment has been recorded repeatedly in painting after painting over centuries. And the church has elaborated it with this divine protection from severe weather by always having candles present or originally having a candle moss. You see in this part of the slide that the symbolism is clear cut to the church. The flame represents Christ's divinity, the wick Christ's soul, and the wax Christ's body. This prediction spread through Europe as the Catholic Church spread through Europe centuries and centuries ago. Um, but it also connected with traditions of the fire festivals, which already were powerful and numerous. Candlemas Day, though, generated a lot of sayings such as these. As the sun shines on Candlemas Day, so far will the snow swirl in May. If Candlemas be fair and bright, come winter, have another fight, flight. If Candlemas brings clouds and rain, go winter. Come not again. And one of the most uh, famous of these sayings we will come to eventually. But what's happened to Candlemas? Well, it's, it's shrunk to the point where on February 2nd in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania in 2014, I stopped by the church to see what was going on there. It wasn't that the church was empty. It's that the doors were locked and everybody was focused on Phil. Candlemas endures in the background as cultural and social sands shift, but it remains obscure and unknown to most of us, I think. It's been overshadowed by Phil, another species making a midwinter prophecy. And Phil himself is generally quickly overshadowed by the Super Bowl, which the point I'm making is that prophecies are culturally and historically based. They're subject to changing times. And this was noted even by poet Robert Herrick in the mid 1600s with this line ending one of his four Candlemas poems. Times do shift, each thing in turn does hold. New things succeed as former things grow old. <clears throat> Let's leave Candlemas behind for a while. Plenty of animals predict weather. One of the animals that most people know about, or lots of people know about, is the woolly bear worm. The woolly uh, worm itself, which is a caterpillar, has these bands on them. And the more severe weather will be shown up in more blackness, and more rust color means the weather is going to be mild. And there are two places, Banner Elk, North Carolina, and Vermilion, Ohio, that even have had festivals uh, every fall to celebrate the predictive powers of this. But there are other animals that celebrate this. Uh, my dog, Tonto, uh, predicts the weather because he's sensitive to atmospheric changes. And that's the key for lots of these other animals. I've mentioned only a few here, cats, cows, birds, sheep, ladybugs. There are others in addition to woolly bears, which moves us closer and closer to this one. <clears throat> Groundhog Day was Badger Day in Germany, where there are badgers, but no groundhogs. And indeed, those of you who are familiar with dachshunds are familiar with a, doc, uh, a type of dog, a badger dog, bred specifically to be able to hunt badgers down in their burrows. But when 
Germans migrated to to Pennsylvania in large numbers. There were no badgers. There was, however, this woodchuck, this woodchuck, incredibly numerous marmot known by many different names who became their substitute and who uh, became our weather prophet for the for this this particular day. All right, let me get, let me say a little bit more about this particular creature. These many different names all are different names for this marmot. In the wild, there are a small group of animals that hibernate by going into a deep coma where the body temperature drops to a few degrees above freezing, the heart barely beats, the blood scarcely flows, and breathing nearly stops. Thus, under natural conditions, they experience near death, but then they're reborn, as in the case of Phil, to foresee the arrival of spring. Before media dominated Phil's predictive qualities, it was more complicated for woodchucks. German immigrants hunted them, dug up groundhogs for food, often roasting them on the spot. Sometimes their hearts and livers were kept and used for special healing potions and poultices. In other words, in focusing on the ceremonial role of Prophet Phil, we're getting only the most dramatic modern view of the creature. Which brings us to Groundhog Phil. Phil has eternal life. He receives special care during the year, each summer, at the groundhog picnic. He receives a secret magical elixir of groundhog punch. Each swallow of the elixir of life prolongs Phil's life for another seven years. And the 20, 2014 event was said to be the 128th in his career. <clears throat> because the big prophecy, his big prophecy, has been made every single year since 1887. It was probably being made before that, but uh, as uh, that day marked the beginning of the Groundhog Club and the elevation of Groundhog Phil to its current status. Today's was the 137th continuous predictions by Dear Phil. Let's look at the place where Phil resides, Punxsutawney. Punxsutawney, name of Indian origin. Well, they didn't want to say that the name seems to have translated as the town of sand flies, town of the mosquitoes, maybe even poison wine. But Native Americans had abandoned this location uh, by the end of the American Revolution, leaving it available for the new German migrants. Have any of you been to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania for the celebration? One of my colleagues in the department is actually from Punxsutawney. But most people have not been, even though it's only three hours away. I encourage you to consider going one of these February 2nds. It's a population of about 5,600. <clears throat> Before the 1993 Groundhog Day movie, which transformed the town. It was attended only by several hundred people, maybe even a thousand people in the town. But after the movie, uh, the town was transformed. It was a, it's a poor, undistinguished, before then, it was a poor, undistinguished, uh, relatively uh, unspecial town, former coal mining town. And after the movie and after Phil's elevation to prophet status, uh, it was been brought back, uh, so to speak, from near death. Now, many people know it. <clears throat> Phil, like all members of the inner circle, is male. Phil has a wife named Phyllis, who stays completely in the background. He has no children. 
and Phyllis doesn't receive the elixir of life, I'm sorry to report. So she doesn't live forever like Phil. Phil's a busy creature. Even before the movie, in 1958, after Sputnik on February 2nd, he went into space on a special Chutnik spacecraft. He claims to have traveled to the moon in 1959 and 1962. I'm a little suspicious of this, but not as other exploits. Phil travels in a groundhog bus, and these days his name is trademarked. Phil has been visited by governors. In fact, the governor of Pennsylvania was there this morning. These governors were there on other years. Phil went to Washington in 1986 and met President Ronald Reagan. These are the only pictures of the occasion, though, that I can find. There are no occasions, no pictures of uh, President Reagan actually being close to Phil or holding Phil, which is probably just as well. After the movie came out and his popularity grew and Punxsutawney became internationally famous, Oprah had Phil on her show. There is a short video of this, which I'm not going to try to play, uh, but there are no individual photographs of Oprah uh, on the same stage with Phil or trying to hold Phil. All right, let's look at what went on and where. This is called Gobbler's Knob. It's my special Gobbler's Knob coffee cup, excuse me. Gobbler's Knob is a, is a small hill, a couple of miles outside Punxsutawney. This is where the big events have taken place for decades. These are the sacred grounds of Phil. He makes his predictions here. Thousands gather here. More later. Looking around town on February 1st, 2014, this is what you might see. This is where Phil lives. He lives in the library. Special privileges for Phil. He doesn't hibernate because he's really too busy to. He's on demand constantly. And you can peek in on him through the big library window anytime you want to. Um, there are Phil's all over town. Every business has a Phil. There are chainsaw carvers of Phil who make uh, hundreds of carvings like this in many different shapes and fashions. There are gift shops. Every restaurant has a linkage to Phil. Phil promotes and advertises the town and individual businesses, including the dentist, the library, It's Phil's town. The Chamber of Commerce doubles as Phil's souvenir shop. shop. Phil, Phil is attached to beer, wine, and even absolute Punxsutawney. There's a Miss Punxsutawney. Phil is, in, is attended by what's called the inner circle of 12 disciples. It's basically his team. These are men from the town who are honored to be taking care of the day and raising money at the same time. And they have names like this, Icebreaker, Iceman, Rainmaker, Thunder Conductor, very important, The Big Chill, the fair weather man, the shingle shaker, and all the names and the people occupying these positions change periodically, but their function is still always to promote Phil, bring attention to the town, 
and to raise money for different organizations. Membership in the inner circle is for life or until one gets tired of all the labor required. Their goal, one man said to me, was to promote the town and to have fun. These distinguished, generous citizens organize and promote Phil's mock serious event of dramatic proportions throughout the year, earning for Punxsutawney charities roughly a million dollars through donations and sales of many different things. <clears throat> The big event is broadcast by the Weather Channel. In 2014, Jim Cantori and Jen Carfagno were there. This morning, Jen Carfagno was there, uh, as well as Alex Wilson, but not Jim Cantori. And that means that the Weather Channel invests a lot of equipment, trucks, and attention, as well as airtime to the event. On the night before, the big day, the big morning, there's a banquet. The banquet is held at the high school, the home of the Chucks, and it's attended by two or 300 people locally and from around the world. The Punxsutawney Man and Woman of the Year are announced. Other recognitions take place. Weather Channel celebrities give speeches and auction off their monogrammed gear. Everyone sings patriotic songs says the Pledge of Allegiance, and prays together. The dinner serves a groundhog fill cookie for dessert, which one of my colleagues said reminded her of a communion wafer. By 3 a.m. up on Gobbler's Knob, thousands of people have gathered. At least when I was there in 2014, there were said to be 20 to 30,000 people. These fuzzy pictures are my pictures. The sharp pictures are by other people. And in 2014, it was only 37 degrees. It was rainy and muddy. Uh, and whereas this morning, it was 13 degrees and extremely cold, attended by an estimated four to 5,000 people instead of the 20 to 30,000 people of previous pre-COVID events. Entertainment goes on vigorously and energetically from 3 a.m. until after 7 a.m. People dress up. It's a fun event. There's no sign of alcohol or any drugs there, although this was a bit of a problem in the vigorous years of the late 90s after the movie came out. Other prophets showed up at the event in 2014, but Pennsylvania state troopers gently uh, escorted them uh, off the property at Gobbler's Knob, and there were no other problems. But this is this is part of the issue for a major uh, legitimate prophet like Phil. More about this in a second. Dawn approaches. The inner circle gathers on the stage. Phil is pulled out from his cozy burrow in the big tree stump on the stage. He is put up on the top of the stump and he is uh, guided by the president of the club who has a special acacia staff to help with the translation. Phil speaks groundhog ease, of course, and the only human who can understand that is the circle's president who translates it into English. Phil picks one of two pre-written announcements for the president to read. And then the prophecy becomes not only translated into English, but broadcast around the world. And this is the 2014 prophecy. A Super Bowl winner I will not predict, but my weather forecast you cannot contradict. 
It's my shadow you see. So six more weeks of winter it shall be, just as he predicted this morning. With these brilliant words, Phil is without question the poet laureate of woodchucks. The astonishing thing is that he's been correct 100% of the time. And he is always lifted high as a presentation to the assembled crowd. But it takes a long time to build up to the announcement and it's over extremely quickly and everyone goes back to warmth. You can, eat, you can take a bus or you can hike back, but it's over and people move on. I want to take a little uh, interlude here and though, talk about the problems of being a groundhog prophet, of Phil's problems. Prophecy, as prophets throughout time illustrate, is a tough world. There are always competitors. There are always people trying to say, no, that can't possibly be. You're a phony. People don't always appreciate prophets, no matter their accuracy. And with Phil, it's especially bad because he's been so successful. There are Phil wannabes all over the place. And those people who deal with these fake prophets uh, have often paid a price because non-Phil uh, interlopers and some of their stories are kind of sad. Some of the different stories that have happened uh, Staten Island Chuck bit Mayor de Blasio in 2014. Uh, unfortunately, he dropped Chuck and it later died, and his death was kept secret for months. As he, you know, the event was covered up. The politics of Phil, of the phony Phils, really are interesting. Uh, an, another mayor in Wisconsin was bitten. Uh, let's focus on Pennsylvania just for a moment. Since Pennsylvania has so many German immigrants who brought with them this uh, groundhog, badger groundhog devotion, there are dozens and dozens of groundhog lodges throughout the state. And uh, these are special gathering places for men. And uh, only fairly recently, uh, actually more recently than the 30s, have women been welcome at many of these lodges. Um, there's a whole, there could be hours spent talking about uh, the German, uh, Pennsylvania, Dutch immigrants and their lodges and everything. But let's look at some of Phil's competitors in Pennsylvania. There's Octaro Orphy, who lives in Lancaster County, uh, the pinnacle of pro prognostication, supposedly, and a competitor of Phil's. The only difference is that Or Orphy is stuffed. Huh? Yes. The stuffed Orphe is brought out and paraded around every February 2nd. There's also a dog, Shapoke Shina, dressed as a bear, pretending to be a groundhog, predicting the weather and the likelihood of an early spring. This is Dover Doug in Harrisburg. What about Ohio's Buckeye Chuck? Okay. What about Michigan's Murray? Well, there were problems with his prediction. This is the thing about false prophets. Even in the South, there's General Beauregard Lee, who lives like this. All kinds of honors. Uh, Las Vegas doesn't have groundhogs, so they've, they've got Mojave Max, a desert tortoise, but they can't figure out exactly when he's going to come out of his burrow. Ontario, Canada has an albino 
or at least had an albino we art and Willie, uh, who apparently uh, tragically died and um, just has stopped appearing. In Nova Scotia, the, the Shubin Akadi Sam, who was kept awake all winter leading up to his big day, and he then escaped and bit the person who tried to capture him. You know, all of these kinds of phonies have resulted in articles like this one that appeared in the Toronto Star in 2021, where this, this Kevin Jung, uh, after considerable research, insisted that Groundhog Day is a farce of unimaginable proportions. Who exactly are the shadowy cabal behind this conspiracy? What are they capable of? This is the type of reaction that serious prophets have always encountered. Imposters, wannabes, skeptics, and critics aside, you know, there's only one Phil. So by 7.15, 7.23 this morning, uh, Phil had made his prediction, and everybody moved on. They moved on to the Super Bowl. And so I'm going to say a little bit about Super Bowls, and then... I'm almost finished. All right. Not many slides of Super Bowl, but a lot of words. Uh, since 1967, the National Football League has held the Super Bowl, an unofficial national holiday orgy combining orchestrated violence, hyper-consumerism, and military symbols. In recent years, the Super Bowl has edged from January into February. And as soon as the date for 2014 was announced by NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell in 2011, speculation took off. The Farmer's Almanac prophesied stormy weather with copious winds, rain, and snow at least 18 months before the game. Americans love statistics. Uh, a, an Italian journalist has called statistics America's tranquilizers. And Super Bowl 48 generated enough statistics to make anybody comatose. I'm focused here on the weather. As soon as the date and the cold weather location were announced, the uncertainties of weather dominated predictions for everything else. Questions about weather upstaged even the point spread in some places for that Super Bowl. Weather data. This is important. Not many enterprises exceed the variety of diverse data collected and processed to accurately predict the weather. With vast amounts of data collected hourly by NASA weather satellites, thousands of private weather stations, the National Weather Service radar stations, weather balloons, buoys at sea, and much, much more. <clears throat> weather predictions more than seven days back, back in 2014, were problematic. Even the best weather prophecies forecast can accurately predict weather about 80% of the time. And a five-day forecast can accurately predict the weather approximately 90% of the time. However, a 10-day or longer forecast is only right about half the time, even today. Complex mathematical algorithms grind vast amounts of weather data in atmospheric science. The National Weather Service supercomputers named Tide and Gyre analyzed more than 1.7 billion observations per day, whizzing through 213 trillion calculations per second, according to NOAA, to yield their scientific predictions. As This is as close as we can ever come to knowing the future. However, it places us scarily in, squarely in the interpretive realm of weather forecasting described by Bruno Latour in Science in Action. And sociologist Gary Allen Fine's Authors of the Storm book detailing an ethnography about the culture of prediction in a National Weather Service office near Chicago. As February approached, articles about the possibility of inclement weather proliferated. Weather Bowl or Snow Bowl replaced Super Bowl in the terminology of weather people and weather companies, self-servingly promoted by the Weather Channel. <clears throat> Remember, the worse the weather, the more, view the more viewers for the Weather Channel. When the weather's good, nobody watches it. 
Roger Goodell, quote, poked fun at the worry warts with fake snowflakes falling from the ceiling during his annual State of the League address two weeks before the game. I told you, he said, we're going to embrace the weather. He all but dared the weather gods to make it snow on Super Bowl Sunday, according to one reporter. Two weeks before the game, the senior meteorologist at AccuWeather called for a high of 36, a game temperature of 32, and a 30% chance of snow. As late as January 25th, one blogger used a global forecast system weather model speculating that a nor'easter would hit New York City during the big weekend. Game day temp was predicted to be 23 degrees with an inch of snow. AccuWeather's Elliot Abrams cautiously, to his credit, predicted game day temps between the teens and the 50s. The Weather Channel's managing editor and on-camera star at the time, Sam Champion, said, there's something romantic about being out there in the cold and snow. By game time, his view was that something dramatic had happened. It's almost like this beautiful oasis in the middle of all we've been seeing. It's almost like the seas are parting just in time for the game. All predictions for weather on the day of the 2014 Super Bowl passed through human interpretations with barely a nod to the vast science of weather prediction. The weather at game time in Rutherford, New Jersey, turned out to be partly cloudy and 53 degrees, 10 to 15 degrees above normal, and only 9 degrees below the record high of 62 degrees set in 1973. On February 2nd, it was warmer in New Jersey than in Anchorage, Alaska, or in both Denver and Seattle, home cities for the teams. Conclusion. Does prophecy matter? Of course it does. Midwinter provides a pivotal moment for important events. The annual astronomical cycle spins on. Spring is close enough to hope for, to predict or prophesy. Yet the vagaries of winter linger and threaten. The usual coincidence, collision, collusion of Candle Moss, Groundhog Day, and Super Bowl 48 in 2014 highlighted important prophetic moments for groups separated by time and rationale with diverse origins, audiences, timing, and purposes, yet each grappling with that unknown future. We go to great lengths to know that future, but despite our best efforts, it remains elusive. We would do well to, to appreciate Phil because he's going to be there waiting patiently for every February 2nd when Groundhog Day will happen again and again and again. Well, I'm finished. Happy Bergen. Thank you, Bob. Happy Candlemas, Midwinter Groundhog Day 2023. And remember, it's all anthropology, making the strange familiar and the familiar strange. But Bob, you have to Thank take you. questions, right? Let me see if I can. Let's, well, let me read out the question from Gary, because uh, I always read the questions out for people who okay. sort of see. I, that would be Gary Ostrauer. Right. He says... Gary says, Bob, we have 4,500 institutions of higher ed and 4,499 have departments of history. Why does not AU and other colleges have a department of the future? Then we could predict with certainty such things as when the Bills will ever win a Super Bowl or if AU next year will put groundhogs in the menu, on the menu in aid. Uh, a department of future predictions. I, I'd rather talk about why we don't have a department of anthropology. Next. <laughs> More questions. Either put, put ask your question in the chat or raise your hand or just um, unmute yourself. Becky. No, you. Oh, my husband wants. To, my husband Craig Prophet wants to know if he's retired. Is he still a prophet? He will always be a prophet, and and we and we're grateful for that. <laughs> and, Me too. 
And I suppose that means I also will always be a false prophet because I married the name. Alas. I am. It will, it, Becky, it will always be true that a prophet is without honor in his own country. And I but, certainly yeah. am, whether I'm in my own country or not, you know. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Bob, I want to go back to my own question. Why, <laughs> you know, there's an Institute of the Future at Wesleyan University in uh, Connecticut. I'm not aware of any other uh, university which has something similar to that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we do study the past, but in a systematic way, we don't study the future. And my question then is, you know, why not? And perhaps since you're an anthropologist, you might be able to, you know, address that not only from the perspective, say, of, uh, you know, our own culture, but other cultures as well. Do they? I, I Gary, I, I would welcome uh, disciplinary reorganization to have an institute of the future to allow us to, uh, you know, our, our disciplines are so uh, old fashionedly organized and they, they need updating because all of these ideas uh, spread across traditional disciplines and deserve comment from each of our different specialties. So maybe that will be part of what happens. But as we move into uh, our media lab at Alfred, for example, we are moving toward the future. We are enabling ourselves to be able to think more broadly and to integrate and broadcast more different kinds of ideas. But uh, again, I'm not, you're not quite answering the question. Why, no, I'm not. Why, why is there not more systematic study of the future is it simply that we are so bad at making predictions that you know i mean we can make reasonable predictions for <laughs> next week and maybe even for next year but we're just dreadful when it comes to making predictions uh say out 20 years uh from now uh is it is is there something you know that connects institutionally to that uh that that kind of difficulty gary i'm sorry i can't give you a satisfactory answer to that but one problem is, you know, you see the different kinds of uh, every time somebody says, well, I know what's going to happen. Uh, a bunch of other specialists chime in and say, no. And and then the other part of that is our culture is changing incredibly rapidly. It's who could have predicted what we've experienced for the last uh, several years, just in terms of media changes and technological changes. God knows what that's going to be like the next time there's a Bergen Forum on February 2nd, but I'm hoping that in 2034, somebody will address that. Gary, it's a, it's a, it's a worthy question, impossible to answer. Can I, can I, can I throw something in there? There, there are future futurists or futurologists, uh, uh, you know, pe people like Alvin Toffler and, and others. I mean, the, it's quite a, an industry. Um, the, one of the problems is they, they uh, like Bob says, they can't get it right because um, the, the way in which everything moves isn't in a straight line, it's in a curve. And so in a very short time, their projections into the future are way off. Um, I think it was Niels Bohr is supposed to have said that... Uh, Predictions are difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> but remember, uh, all, well said, Emrys. Thank you. We we have a futurologist, Peter Van Arstel, who is in communication studies, and is currently uh, organizing and leading the new media lab. So maybe we should take advantage of what we have available to us here and now. We can create that new department drawing from different present day departments. And can I just say it's, it's Peter von Stackelberg, but I'm just th thank you. I'm Peter. I'm, I'm so sorry. Peter von Stackelberg. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Apologies. But the obvious thing to do would be to connect him up with the people who are investing the endowment. <laughs> <laughs> um we're quite a long way past the time when we usually end does anyone have any more questions i want to put any more questions in the chat um 
if not, I would like to thank Bob for a um, wonderful presentation. Very informative, very entertaining, and very thought-provoking. So thank you, Bob. My pleasure, Emrys. Thank you very much. Okay. And next week, the Bergen Forum should be back in Nevins. See you there. See you then. <laughs>